Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In the article, Corporate Governance and Ethics of Feminist Perspective, one of the topics that, of course, needs to be addressed, and it is towards the end of the article, is, well, what would feminist corporate governance actually look like? What would, what would the application of feminist values and feminist theory and women's experiences and the ethics of care, what would that bring to organizations? So one of the key aspects that's that's discussed before <clears throat> going into the final section of, of a governance model is how organizations could be reconceptualized. There's a lot of different ways in which uh, organizations can be uh, depicted or thought about or modeled. And very often we'll look at, say, the table of organization and who reports to who or things like that. And that does capture some aspect of relationships. But that only captures some portions of it. That's sort of the structure of reporting, or you might, you know, look at uh, task management. Any organization is actually a much wider network of relationships. People talking to each other in the lunchroom, for example. Um, Co-workers who happen to have gone to the same school and chit-chat with each other uh, for that reason. And, and so it's not simply about the, the ways in which organizations have traditionally be, been conceived. Um, they are, in fact, networks. Now, a key question that comes up is, well, is it possible for organizations, even if they're understood as networks of relationships, can they, the kinds of entities that they are, can they care? Or is that something that's only... Uh, possible for individuals in relationship with each other. And there's some skepticism about this. Uh, for example, Nell Noddings uh, is, is, you know, quite skeptical about the possibility of extending an ethics of care to institutions or nation states or other, or, you know, organizations of human beings. Um, but organizations are not, as, as the, the authors are pointing out, just abstract entities. They're not just boxes that you put a bunch of things into. They are made up of individuals, and those individuals are going to have uh, varying degrees of care orientation, either deliberately or as part of their, their background and, and upbringing and education. So... If you've got individuals, then doesn't that mean that the organization itself can care? Well, the answer is a little bit more complicated than that. And here we bring in what we call necessary and, and sufficient conditions. So caring individuals are a necessary condition for having a caring organization. You can't have a caring organization without actual people doing caring. You've got to have somebody on the ground floor, so to speak, right? You've got to have people representing the organization in their activities. So that's a necessary condition. It's not a sufficient condition. And this is something that many people experience within organizations. Uh, they find themselves being affected quite negatively by the fact that they're, they're caring sometimes puts them at a disadvantage, you know, think about, for example, call centers where you have a certain quota uh, that you're supposed to meet and you have customers calling in with problems. Now, if you're going to be empathetic with them and listen to their story instead of saying, well, listen, I got a quota. I got to cut through this narrative. Tell me what your problem is, buddy, so I can, you know, uh, delegate it to the right person or, or give you the right, you know, uh, tutorial or something like that. If you're not being caring, you might uh, be able to process a lot more cus uh, yeah, customers and then therefore meet your quotas. But if you are being caring, even though that should be a value of the business, you may be at a disadvantage. 
So it's not a sufficient condition. What, what's required? Um, what's needed in order to actively support care on the um, part of those caring individuals? And so Liedka suggests that a caring organization, in addition to being composed of individuals who meet the conditions of being caring, would need to actively support their efforts through its goals, systems, strategies, and values. And it's not enough just to have it in the mission statement. We care about our customers. That means that if somebody needs to spend more time on the line, there need to be some sort of procedures for clicking a button and saying, listen, supervisor, uh, I'm not going to meet my quota today, but I'm doing something that's good for the company and good for the customer, and this should be respected. And the, co the company should allow for that, that sort of thing. If it doesn't, then you've got a significant problem. This is a major issue when it comes to handling customer complaints and problems. But you could think about how this would affect sales. You could think about how this might affect uh, the inner workings of the company as well, how training and mentoring and coaching would work. So there's a lot involved here. What would a feminist corporate governance model actually look like? There's, there's a number of different features that get picked out in this, this paper. So one is that it does not limit the scope of relationships that it cares about simply to whether they're contractual or not, or fiduciary or not. It says the feminist governance model recognizes a multiplicity of actual and potential relationships with varying degrees of asymmetry in power distribution within which there is an obligation to care. So that, that's another key point that we're going to hit on. Another is that it prioritizes all individuals, not just some, but all individuals with whom a relationship uh, is established, whether in the past a relationship has been established, a relationship is being established in the present, or a relationship could be established in the future. So if we think about how this would affect uh, stakeholder uh, analysis and theory, if you're proposing, say, releasing pollution into the environment, um, you are now going to have a relationship with everybody affected by that, right? And you have a duty to care, not to damage their uh, environment, even if it has to do with, like, you know, impinging on uh, uh, the, the fauna of, the flora, sorry, of walking paths. Well, the fauna matters too as well, right? Flora, plants, fauna, animals. Um, there's also an obligation to care. This is absolutely central. So, the, the, so they say the universal principle underpinning the governance relationships, all the relationships within the structure of the company, is the obligation to care a sense of responsibility in individuals within and outside the organization to nurture others. And they give a really great example of this here, uh, talking about um, managers learning about the background and identity of those within their immediate care, understanding the individual's need, need for job satisfaction or a work-life balance and empathizing with it. Now think about how transformative that would be for so many workplaces if managers actually held themselves to that sort of of standard. They also do point out this doesn't mean, as they the, the, use their word, molly coddling people, right? Uh, this doesn't mean being a pushover, but this does mean relating to people as uh, another person, as an individual. Another key thing is embedding care within internal and external systems and procedures of the company. It's not enough to have caring individuals. It's not enough to have caring managers. It needs to be made part of the structure of the company. It needs to probably needs to be reinforced over and over again by uh, management and management who aren't just hypocrites talking the talk about that, but actively supporting care. Unfortunately, in so many institutions, we see the language of care being used, but not being embodied by the management or the executive leadership. Uh, finally, caring, uh, and this is a very important point, caring must not be limited to a select group. And the example that they use there is of managers. 
So you can't, you know, have a caring organization where the managers are really well taken care of and supported. You know, people inquire about their work-life balance and how their kids are doing and all all that sort of stuff. Um, but the employees are cut out of it. That is not going to work. As a matter of fact, that's just simply reinforcing, uh, it, you know, sort of traditional structures. You also couldn't do it just favoring the workers either. Uh, and, and ignoring management. Nor could you do it by giving such great customer service that you make things so difficult for uh, management and employees, right? Everybody matters. Another one that I think could be a particularly tempting prospect, especially if resources are scarce, is focusing on high performers. We need to really be really supportive of these high performers and make sure that they feel, uh, you know, uh, entirely taken care of, that they're cared for, we're empathetic to their problems, but screw everybody else. They, they don't really matter. Uh, you know, a great example of, of this sort of mentality would be um, the, the, you know, uh, famous line from Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, Coffee is for closers. That, that embodies that. Yeah, now, they're not very caring in that movie. I advise you to take a look at it as well. But um, if, you, if you think about it, that notion of, well, we're going to provide things for you. We're going to provide a supportive environment. But only if you're performing. That's not really the ethics of care. Now, again, it's not to say that, that people can be strung along indefinitely, uh, being taken care of within a business environment. Sooner or later, everybody has to produce. But the ethics of care would in, embody some sort of, you know, mentoring, coaching, developmental process that embodied all of these, these aspects. So that is what corporate governance would look like if it was truly informed by feminist ethics.